Hello, Welcome. everyone. Oh, we've got a great program today. <laughs> yes, we do. And you're going to be thrilled when you find out what he is doing today. It's, he's a man after my own heart. Our guest, Ken Harrison, The Rise of the Servant King, is the name of a book he's written. And, and I can just tell you, and I've only known him a couple minutes, but he is my kind of guy. He's a real man of God. And he is a servant himself. And music today by Mark Payne. What a great thing to have Mark with us today. Yes, we love having you, Mark. And he's going to start by playing In Jesus' Name. Thank you. 
Thank what you. a joy to have you. What a way to open the program. Yes. And today we have with us Ken Harrison, and he's the president and chairman of Promise Keepers. And some of you just said, oh, I haven't heard that for a long time. Promise Keepers. Well, you're going to hear more about it. Yes. And he is the CEO, also serves uh, Cornerstone Christian. I'm not sure what that is. Community. And oh, he gives away. I don't know if he still does it, but he's given away over a million dollars a week. And I think that's Waterstone. Waterstone, okay. <laughs> to build God's kingdom. He's built a tremendous real estate company and now, and he was in the police uh, in Los Angeles Police Department for a long time. You would think this guy is really old. He's done so many things. <laughs> and But he was in the police department and in Watts, do you know where Watts is? In uh, so one of the most dangerous areas of Los Angeles, correct? Yeah. Yes. And he is a book writer, and he's mm -hmm. just written this new book, Rise of the Servant King. Now you're not going to understand what that means until we get into speaking with Ken. God bless you. It's so good to have you. It's an honor to know you. Honor to know you. And uh, we have so many things in common. Uh, my son retired from the Sheriff's Department and uh, just recently in the last year or two and uh, did, you didn't retire. No. No. You got out while you were still living. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, but you've got a tremendous calling on your life. It's one of the greatest callings in our country. I'll tell you that. Mm. That is the promise keepers. Yes. Absolutely. And tell us what promise keepers is doing now. And we had seven million men go to Promise Keepers events in the 90s in NFL stadiums. And um, really, um, Promise Keepers lost its vision. It lost its way. It got too scattered. And now we've refocused it. We've gone back to our identity of who we really are. So we're going to be back at Dallas Cowboy Stadium uh, in July 31st and August 1st of 2020. And we're going to have 80,000 men singing Amazing Grace, hearing the best speakers in the world, and pouring our hearts out for this country. Wow. Well, who is Promise Keepers for? Well, that's for men, all men. And, uh, you know, we'll have really bold preachers from the stage. But in the audience, we want every man that wants to know Jesus. And I don't care who they are, where they came from, how bad they think they are. I don't care if they're Muslim. Uh, Protestant, Catholic, Evangelical, Charismatic, Homosexual, whoever they are, come and get to know Jesus Christ. And we're going to declare the truth of God's Word with boldness. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, have you heard stories from the last 30 years ago from people that attended Promise Keepers and their lives were changed? Did you hear from parents, like mothers, sisters, families, children that, whose father or brother went and their lives were transformed? Well, we've heard so many. Uh, my favorite is we called, uh, the average gift that Promise Keepers gets is less than $5 a month. And so I asked someone to call um, some people and just say, what are you giving to? And what, what do you want to see Promise Keepers doing? And he got a hold of a woman who was a recent widow. And she said that uh, she had been given $5 a month for 25 years. And she said her husband was a pastor. And he went to Promise Keepers and he came back. She said, the man I got back was so utterly changed that I promised I would give every penny I had to Promise Keepers for the rest of my life. And then she wow. said, I hope you're not calling to ask me for more money because <laughs> I'm giving everything I have. 
And it was at that moment that I made a commitment that I would never take money from Promise Keepers because I want her $5 going to save men's souls, not to mm. pay my mortgage. You know, that reminds me of 40 years ago when we started this. Uh, a lady came up to me, and, and we didn't even have a bank account yet or anything, gave me $9 and, and did that for years, gave me $9. And uh, now the program goes, not the program, but the programs go all over the world. And, we're just uh, thrilled to know people like that. She's yeah. gone now, but uh, giving $9. Mm. And, and that is such a thrill to me when the smallest gift means so much. And I know it does to promise keepers. Now, how do you give away a million dollars a week? <laughs> I wish I had any control over it. <laughs> Waterstone Foundation is, um, it, what it does is it helps people to give money away when they want to and to give away complicated assets. And so what we say is you can give away, um, and rather than giving cash, you can give away stock and get a double tax break. So Waterstone is attorneys and CPAs who are experts in tax law who help Christians take their money and give it away as wisely as they can and keep as much from Uncle Sam as they can and give away when they want. So they control where the money goes, but we help them to give it. So it comes through us. What, through the Promise Keepers? Through Waterstone, the foundation. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, going back to Promise Keepers, how can people find out how to get in touch or even go? What website do they go to? Well, promisekeepers.org is the website. And tickets are not yet for sale because what we found is we've been contacted by thousands of people all over the country saying, I've already taken my vacation for next year. I've been waiting for this for 20 years for you all to be back. Um, the comments we get on Promise Keepers are really two of the ones I get that are so passionate. One is, and I've heard this hundred, literally hundreds of times, some from guys in tears who said, the feeling of 70,000 men singing Amazing Grace is so overwhelming that, and you can't replicate it. And I, I think it's the power of the Spirit. It's the power of that unity of men together. Um, and it's also, I think, a reminder that I'm not alone. And in today's society, we feel yes. more and more like, gosh, has the world gone crazy? And all of a sudden, you're in this stadium, and there's all these guys who think just like you. And you're hearing speakers who are encouraging you to stay passionate and persevere in your faith. The other thing I hear all the time, and this is really moving, it's from guys who now are in their upper 30s to upper 40s, who talk about how they went to Promise Keepers with their fathers when they were teenagers, and how that was the first time their dad ever told them that he loved them. Wow, they amazing. saw their dad in tears for the first time, repenting before the Lord for the stuff that that boy knows his dad did. And there was a unity there, and I've had these young men say, I so want to take my teenage son like my dad took me, or I want to take my elderly father now to that yeah. event. So tickets aren't for sale yet because we have pre-registration. And what that does is it allows guys to go onto the website at promisekeepers.org, enter in, it's free, but it allows you to reserve a ticket so that when they go for sale, you be sure to get one because we don't want the thing selling out right away to everybody in Dallas and you have all these people in Michigan or somewhere going, man, I really wanted to go and I can't, so. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Now. Tell me about, you said they're going to purchase the tickets. How much are the tickets? <laughs> <laughs> they're $99 for a normal. They are discounted if you bring your sons because we don't want people to be priced out. They're also discounted significantly if you're an active military, a vet, or a first responder because, as you know, yeah. first responders are near and dear to your heart and mine. <laughs> Um, and we want to make sure that the people, who, nobody is priced out. We're also holding back 10% of the tickets, so 8,000 tickets, to give away as scholarships. Because we're not doing this because we need the money. We learned at Promise Keepers that men don't value what they don't pay for. And if we make the tickets for free, 
then yeah. they'll grab a ticket and not show up. Men value what they make an investment in. And it's a blessing, too, because a guy can say to his neighbor, I really want to take you to this, and I've paid $100 for your ticket. And the neighbor felt, well, okay, I got to go. We bought a $100 ticket. And so it, it, there's power there. And so we never, ever want to be about money, and we never want someone to not be able to come because of finances. And so once the tickets go for sale, um, if somebody doesn't have the means, we will have scholarships for them, not only for the ticket, but also for food, for parking, for hotel mm -hmm. rooms. We want men to be blessed by the Lord because heaven knows they're not hearing God's word boldly spoken in very many places these days. They are next year in Dallas, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how long will it last? It'll be a Friday night and a Saturday morning, maybe in early into the afternoon. And we're gonna take on two issues that are very serious. Um, and controversial. And the first issue we're going to take on is abortion. Because there was never an abortion done in this country or in the world that a man didn't have something to do with. And we as men need to t stand up and take responsibility. First mm -hmm. way we do that is by not causing abortions because we only have uh, intimate relations with our wife and nobody else. Um, the second way we do that is by supporting women who have unwanted pregnancies. What can we do to serve them? The third thing is if we sin and we cause an unwanted pregnancy, we support that woman and we, we help her out. And lastly, we stand up against abortion in the public sphere. The, the second thing we're going to take on in a bold way is, is pornography because it's destroying our country. It's destroying the mindset of our men. And so, like I said, we're going to be pretty bold next year. We're going to tell men what they need to hear. Hmm. Yeah. You well, know, you're not going to tell us who the speakers are. I would tell you if I knew. <laughs> we are, uh, we're not in a hurry. I, I've been talking to people all over the world about being speakers. We've chosen one speaker so far, that's Greg Steer uh, from Dare to Share because he is an awesome, awesome passionate man um, who his, his mother went to have an abortion with him and he was illegal in Colorado, it was before Roe versus Wade and her parents rescued her and she at the last minute decided to have him and he is such a great man of God. The other six or seven speakers we're just praying about, we've got a whole group of guys Good that are awesome. You. but. We're not in a hurry. And you've got some intercessors <laughs> yes, playing we about do. this too, don't you? Including you now. Yeah. <laughs> we talked in the green room. I said, hey, we <laughs> pray on Wednesdays. We'll be praying. And that's when your group meets. And we're so grateful to that. Yeah. We need godly women holding us up. Tell us about uh, the second um, subject you're going to talk about. Well, so we have abortion and we have pornography. Oh, and okay. I know they're related, uh, but those will be the two things. And we're going to give guys a chance to come down and repent of those sins and to affirm them as men because this will not be a time where we beat men up. They don't need to be beat up. They need to be encouraged. They need to be reminded of who they are in God, that God loves them. Jesus has forgiven their sins. And let's start acting like children, like sons of God, yes. and not what the world tells us we are this toxic masculinity garbage that gets spoken to men nowadays. Satan is the great accuser. And what do we have going on in our society right now? It's accusing and finger pointing. That's all from the devil. That is not from the Lord. We want to build men up and remind them that they are kings in God's kingdom. So that's where the name comes from. You're what, a king. What a segue. <laughs> and I'm a king. Yes. <laughs> and this book will thrill you. It's it's an exciting book, but it has a purpose, and the purpose is lifting up Jesus. Yes, and for those of you that love stories, there are the Word of God. It's full of the Word of God, but it's also full of the, some of the neatest stories I have ever heard. Wow. So maybe you can, uh, in our second segment, talk about Juan, too, uh. and what Juan got into. Well, it's sad about Juan. It's very but sad. I think there are some people that are probably in the situation he was in. So, you know, you could relate to that. But we're going to come back and talk about why you wrote Rise of the Servant Kings and what it's really about. And we're going to take a break right now. You like the music, don't you? I do. Well, Mark Payne is one We're coming of the best. back. We love it when Mark comes. Mark.
everybody, I'm Laura Harris-Smith, author and host of The Three. Hey, what were you doing 40 years ago? 40 years ago, I was a high school student trying to find my way, and you know what? I don't know what you were doing, but let me tell you what CTN was doing. They were creating a way to feed you body, mind, and spirit. Would you join me in giving to them and saying, happy birthday, CTN. Thank you, Mark. 
You don't hear no. piano playing like no, that. I got to play. <laughs> you do not. He's really great. Well, we've been talking to Ken Harrison, and we've been talking about, I think, one of the most powerful things that is happening in the world today. Besides the revival going on, there is promise keepers coming back. And uh, he's written a book, Rise of the Servant Kings, and we never have learned yet what the servant kings are. So could you tell us? <laughs> Absolutely. Every man is called to be a king in his own sphere, to be accountable and responsible for that which is in his charge. And so for a single man, we need to live, live up to what Scripture tells about men. It says in Isaiah 1, that God wants men who are jealous for his name, care for the poor and the oppressed, and stand for justice. And we have too many men keeping Amen. their head down and not taking stands because they don't want to be uncomfortable. Yeah. And uh, we know Jesus promised, you know, that if we did it all right, we'd be really comfortable and popular. <laughs> no. He, yeah, right. He said if we're living for him, we would be hated, right? That's so, yes. true. Someone came up to me once and said, I'm praying for you, Ken, because Satan really hates you. Yeah. And I <laughs> sure said, well, it's better than being liked by him. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's the truth. Not true. A, a, a king in, in his family understands that he's accountable for the spiritual state of his family. He's accountable for teaching his kids God's word. And he's accountable to yes. presenting his wife spotless and blameless to his father in heaven, just the way Jesus is going to present his wife, the church. Amen. So then as servants, we're not kings as rulers. We're kings as men who lay down our lives for our families because we love Jesus Christ and what he did for us. And we're commanded in, in uh, Ephesians 5.25 to love our wives like Christ loved the church. And how did he love the church? He was tortured yeah, to death for her. And so I think every woman's desire um, is to be cherished by her husband, to know that he would do whatever it takes for her honor and her care, because our template as a great husband is Jesus, the husband of the church. Do you think yes. I'll do everything for you? <laughs> You're great. You're awesome, honey. <laughs> no, God is awesome. You know, I have something to say about this book, too. I loved it. You know, here I am, a woman reading this. This is not just for men. Women will really glean from this book. I've learned a lot from this book. I loved it. Well, so thank, thank you. you for writing it. You talk about gender roles mm. and how, and we all know this is so true. Gender is being attacked in this country like never before, and especially the masculine gender. So how are people, people being deceived in all this? And you know, and I would say, and I agree, the masculine role is being attacked in such a, um, a vivid way. I think femininity has been getting attacked too. I yeah, don't think yeah. we honor strong women in our society yeah, that's at all. True. Do we yeah. lift up mothers for what they go through? My goodness gracious, if men had to give birth, we would have stopped at one generation. <laughs> yeah, you know? I would uh, say amen to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> The genders are both a representation of God's image. This is so important. We have to remember we have an enemy, Satan, and his greatest tool against us is that he's a liar and he's an accuser. Yes. And he wants to pull us away from relationship with God. He wants us to not realize that we're God's children. So in Genesis 1 through 3, we're given two creation stories. The, the creation story, and then it goes back and sort of gives us more information about how God created males and females. And he says that they, male and female, are in his image. So a fully masculine man and a fully feminine woman together are the representation of the image of God. Mm -hmm. So if we destroy masculinity, we don't understand who God really is. That's right. The gender confusion idea is simply Satan moving down the road of, of our own evil instincts inside. In Romans 8, it says that creation cries out for the sons of God to be revealed so it can be released from its curse under sin. Every one of us is born with twisted, a twisted nature. I mean, let's just take this, this, this sin of gossip. What is it in us that would make us feel good about saying something bad about our friend to somebody else? And yet, yeah. it is such a temptation throughout the church and throughout the world. So take all the different sins that we have. The gender thing basically says, I'm not content with who God made me, so I want to be something else. And Satan just pushes that right along. And he's going to continue to push it successfully until the people of God stand up and say, enough, this is nonsense. And the problem is right now we have a spirit of cowardice in the men of the church 
they won't stand up because they don't want to be uncomfortable. They don't want to get sued. We're called to lay down our lives for, for the truth. And I'm going to lay down my life. And I, I know you've laid down your life. Have you ever been sued? Uh, more times than I can count. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the joys of being an L.A. policeman. <laughs> wow. And that's true. Well, uh, I don't know if you wanted to talk about this or if you're kind of getting into it, but the four, you talk about in the book about four areas of destruction coming The decline against. of masculinity? Is that okay. what you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, I tie it into Revelation 21.8. And Revelation 21.8 is not talking about that, but I think it's a really good template for us to look at. And Revelation 21.8 is a verse, if people have been, again, deceived by Satan and think that no one's going to hell, uh, that verse you just simply can't argue with. God goes into different things that says, if you're like this, if this typifies your life, then you're going to go to hell. And uh, I think it, it's worth noting, it says all liars in that passage. Yeah. If you're a liar, you might really want to check your salvation status and, and really think about repenting before the Lord because it's clear that liars are not truly saved. Um, so the first one is passivity. And this is where we see most men in the church today, I think. It's, I'm just not really going to get involved. I mean, they're not bad guys. They go to church. They do the right thing. But they're not passionate about standing up for justice, as we talked about earlier from Isaiah 1. They're not jealous for God's name. Um, the second rung down in passivity, or excuse me, in the lack of masculinity is the macho. It's the violent. It is the guy that, you know, the older I get, the better I was syndrome, you know. Yeah. Um, these kids these days are not as good as we were. Yeah. Um, the third is, is really where we see the state of the world right now. It's the perverse and the greedy. And, and by the way, in 1 Corinthians 5, it tells us not to have anything to do with Christians who are perverse or greedy. That uh, might want to check us on how we run our churches. But um, the perverse and greedy, you know, this is the porn addiction. This is seeing women as objects for our gratification. This is, I never have enough. I need the next car, the next thing. And we, so we jump in our $150,000 Mercedes and we drive past abject poverty. And I'm not judging anybody for, for driving their Mercedes. I'm just saying, check what your interests are. And, and then lastly, it's complacency. And complacency is the worst form of evil because complacency is when you've finally gotten to the point where you see a lack of justice, you see people getting persecuted, and you do nothing. This is what we saw from the Lutheran church during World War II. Um, I love to tell a story about the Christian leader in uh, the Netherlands who during World War II, when the Nazis came in, the Christians went to him and said, what should we do about the Jews? What were they saying? Well, the Jews are being horrifically persecuted, but we're not sure if we should be uncomfortable. And this leader said to them, I can't tell you what you should do, but I can tell you who you are. And if you know who you are, you'll know what to do. That's good. This is what men today need. Men yes. need to be reminded of who they are, that they, they need to be heroes to their daughters. Their daughters Absolutely. need to know. That, men need to understand that their daughters are looking at them for who they're going to marry, how they should be treated. Coach Bill McCartney, who started Promise Keepers, famously said, the best thing a man can do for his kids is to love their mother. Hmm. And hey, some, some mothers aren't lovable, but you married her. And, and you still have to love them. Get on your knees and pray for her. Yeah. And even on the other side, women, gosh, pray for your husbands. They need it. Affirm, their, affirm their manhood. Build them up, don't tear them down. They need it. Amen. Amen. Boy, that's, that's good. Uh, you talk about accountability, and I just thought, boy, if there is ever a day and age for accountability, it is now, isn't it? And for men and women, but men have the pornography thing. Mm -hmm. And if they have somebody they can talk to and go to that won't judge them, that won't ridicule them, but will just give them sound wisdom from the Word of God, how, how important is that? Accountability is a start of masculinity. It's understanding that I'm accountable for who I am and for who my family is. And we have this whole thing run amok right now with men who blame their dads for everything. I was talking to a famous musician who explained to me that, you know, all the things he'd done wrong in his life were all because of his father. And then he turned around and explained to me how screwed up his kids were, and that was all other stuff. It wasn't his fault as the dad. Mm. You know, what, a, what a, a non masculine man wants to do is blame others. What a masculine man does is say, look in the mirror and say, if something's not right, what am I going to do to change it? What am I doing to cause this? 
and what am I going to do to change it? In, in, in marriages that are broken, the beginning point for a man is to say, something isn't right here, and what can I do to fix it? And that doesn't mean he can fix it. I've got a, a dear friend who is a very godly man whose wife isn't a Christian, and after 10 years of marriage, she left him. He did everything right, and she still left him. So we can't control others. We control ourselves. Through Jesus Christ, we give others grace, and we never judge them. We, we pour ourselves out for them, and we have to understand sometimes... How many times was Jesus rejected? Well, he was rejected by pretty much the whole world. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're going to get rejected if we do things right, and that's okay. We have to persevere. Amen. Yeah. You're ready for this rejection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I don't know if I'm ready. Will we ever know? <laughs> well, what's the, what's the difference in leadership and accountability in, uh, I'm sorry, authority in a marriage? That's a great question. Now I go into that a little bit because we've misconstrued that. Uh, we've misconstrued scripture around uh, marriage. A husband is, is told to lead his wife. He's not to be an authority over his wife. And a wife is said to uh, submit to her husband, not to obey her husband. And those are very important word distinctions. We obey somebody who is in authority, like a police officer or if we're in the military, out of a f fear of punishment. We don't submit to them. Submit requires equality, a choice. So we as men, therefore, we need to be the kind of man our wife would choose to submit to. We don't demand obedience. We don't rule over them. Rather, we're a man who so cherishes her, makes her so, feel so protected and provided for, that she gladly says, honey, wherever you go, I'll go. That's submission. That's good. Not hmm. obedience. Yeah. Wow. Uh, We've, you've got so many great stories in this book, Rise of the Servant Kings. And uh, I know you were thinking about the story of Juan. Juan, yes. Because <laughs> that was an amazing story of Juan feeling guilty. He talked about Jesus because he felt guilty of what he was doing. Would you just talk about his story a little bit? Juan was this really handsome six foot three Argentinian. And he had so many girlfriends that back then, I don't know if it's still today, but back then adultery was punishable on the LAPD. That The sergeants had to tell him to have his girlfriend stop sending flowers to the station. And oh, he, wow. he, he was married, had all these girlfriends, and one day he introduced me to this beautiful German girl who had a two-year-old son, and he said to me, someday I'm going to be a father to that boy. And I said to Juan, your wife might find that to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Juan constantly talked about how bad he felt about what he was doing, but it didn't stop him. And I, I started to realize, I think it was his strong Catholic background in Argentina, he felt like if he talked about it, if he felt bad about it, somehow that was some sort of penance. And I see Christians do this all the time, yeah. right? We have these ways that we, we wallow in guilt. If I feel really bad about it, somehow that God doesn't want us to feel guilty. He wants us to feel free. Yeah. That's why he died for us on the cross. So one, um, one night I sort of go through the adventures of him trying to talk to me about what he's doing and we keep having these things come up that, that he can't get it out. And finally I tell Juan, we have three days off coming up. I'll, I'll come in early to the station because I've got to go find an apartment for my, my bride. I was going to get married in a month. And, um, and I can't, I just can't take a day off to talk to you. But he says, well, I want to talk about Jesus. And so I showed up to work two, two hours early on our time back. No one at roll call at 10 o'clock at night, a captain walks in. You never want to see a captain at roll call. Because <laughs> you know there's something up. You know there's something up. They don't come to roll call and they especially don't come at 10 o'clock at night. And the captain said that Juan had taken his girlfriend in Mexico, this German girl, and killed her and killed himself. And the tragedy of this macho man who had everything that we, the world says we want. He was respected, girlfriends, all the stuff, and yet he killed himself. And that goes to show how the traditional idea of masculinity, the, the, the man who drinks a lot and is stoic and has no feelings and is promiscuous, um, instead this guy orphans a child. Yeah. <clears throat> how sad. What a sad story. We're going to take a break. And um, even more music by Mark Payne. I can't we'll wait. Be, we'll be right back. We're looking forward to it.
a tamarisk tree, that's one of the coolest places in the desert. It literally is. No wonder the Bible tells us in Genesis that when Abram was at Beersheba, and that's where we are, he planted a tamarisk tree. I think the Bible has another message here. Why would you even include that little detail except for the fact that Abram was already more than 100 years old? If you ever reach a ripe old age and you start planting trees, you're not really planting those trees for yourself. You're planting them for the next generation. And the lesson from Beersheba is that there's a question the Bible asks us. What are you doing for that next generation in your own life? In Beersheba, I'm Andy Cook, helping you experience Israel right now.
man that knows how to tinkle the ivories. <laughs> That's what you say. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Well, right now it's time for We the People. And we need to be more informed about our Christian heritage. And that's kind of what we've been talking about today. And we'll be better citizens for it. And here is this edition of We the People. Today is a history lesson on the truth of the Christian founding of our country. I'm going to share one simple fact, but to make it a little more fun, let's play a trivia game. We're going to the colony of Virginia in 1617. What did the governor's decree proclaim that had to be done every Sunday? A, every person should wash their clothes by the stream. B, every person should apply soap to their saddle. C, every person should scour their cooking pot. Or D, every person should go to church Sundays and holidays. Of course, the first three are pretty good ideas, but the answer is D. The governor's decree was that everyone should attend church. The governor wanted to make sure that his state was a moral and upright society guided by the Bible. This is a politician that wanted to ensure the safety and success of his colony, so he made it mandatory that the people of Virginia attend church. Our simple history fact for today points to the Christian founding of our country. There wasn't a separation of Christianity from the government, it was the exact opposite. The early government pointed to the Bible as the moral guide for the people and the colony of Virginia is just one more proof. Every person should go to church Sundays and holidays. Just one more historical fact proving the truth that our early founders included Christianity in the government. Amen. Yes, amen. And I know Ken can say amen to that too. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> we want to talk about humility. That is a word that we don't understand, I don't think. Tell us about being humble. You know, the Bible says that a righteous man discerns all things or judges all things, but he himself is judged by no one. Well, how do we judge who is a good Christian? If you're a young lady looking for a man to marry, how do you judge if he is a man of God? Lots of people can fake it. And what I have found is humility is the signpost of someone who really loves Jesus because you understand what he did for you and that you had nothing to do with it on your own. The outward expressions of humility in a man are courage and generosity. Courage because when you don't see yourself as the most important person in the room, you'll always stand up for what's right, That's despite good. the cost to you. Hmm. It also means you'll share your faith, despite the fact that you might get rejected. Um, generosity is a generosity of spirit. It's not just giving generously of money, which it is. It's not just tipping well, which a lot of Christians need to be reminded of. <laughs> hey, that waitress saw you praying, she heard your conversation, tip well, yes. represent our Lord well. Yes. Um, but it's generosity of spirit. It's noticing that that girl who just made your latte really looks sad and saying, is there something I can pray for you for? Is there something? And it's risk to yourself when you do that because you might end up in a conversation for the next two hours with a broken person. Isn't that what we're here for? That's right. Yes. I've led more people to Christ with that question than any other question. Really? Is there one thing I can pray for you for? And you know, most of the time it's something s simple, but every once in a while, you really learn something mm. about a person. So yes, it's generosity. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. A lot of people don't understand what humility is. And me, for example, I don't realize how humility uh, serves people. And that's really what it is. It's serving others. And that's how we become humble. I know a lot of people uh, think, well, they're there to serve me. But we're here to serve other people. And I think that's a hallmark of humility, mm. is serving others. And uh, you're going to do that. Um, 
not only from the book, but you're going to really do it when they come to Promise Keepers. That is going to be, you're going to see some humble men there learning humbly, humbly for the first time (laughs) how to be humble and what it really means. It's not weakness. It's really that's right. It's not knowing weakness. God, knowing that He is the one that will make us humble. If we only realize that He is above all, and we're humble before Him, Amen. 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 Well, we're in agreement with that. And can we? You've got four or five minutes to talk to not only men, but who's ever listening, but primarily men today about if they don't know Christ, maybe they talk about him, but they don't really know him. What would you tell them? On the humility side, first, I would say um, humility is not a lack of confidence. The most confident I have found are the most humble. Self-loathing and shyness and, and those things, they don't come from humility. They come from a, a thinking about ourselves. When we know who we are in Jesus, when our sins have been forgiven, and this is where we really need to understand the radical grace of Jesus Christ, that he came to save us. And so I would say to men, um, you know, you asked about stories when we started the show. I talked to a gal, she's you know, in, her, in her 30s now, but she was 19 when her dad came from a Promise Keepers event and got saved. He had been an alcoholic, he'd been abusive, she felt unloved, her, her life was on the wrong track, she was in college. He came back so utterly transformed by the grace of Jesus that she is now this great woman of God. And so I would say to men out there that don't give up, don't listen to the lies of Satan and think, oh, it's too late. You can make a difference. Your daughter, your kids, they want so desperately to know that you love them, even if they reject you because you've made big mistakes. And so I would say no matter how bad your sins are, um, no matter how bad of things you've thought, the grace of Jesus Christ is all-powerful. It will cover all of your sins. If you'll just give up your pride and just go before him and say, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I'm, broke, I'm broken, I, I give up, I give up trying to be good enough. And that's when the grace of Jesus rushes in. That's when he'll give us the seed of his Holy Spirit in us. And that's when we can truly become great men. We can't become great men by trying to be great men. We become great men by giving up our self-effort and, bring, and asking the Lord Jesus to come in into our heart. Amen. Amen. Uh, if you don't know the Lord, today is your day. Today is the day of salvation. It's not waiting for promise keepers. It's not next week. Today is the day. This is the hour for you to say, God, forgive me of my sin. Make me over anew. Make me what you want me to be, not what things that I think I should be but what you want me to be. We thank you, Father. And we pray that these men watching now will come to the place of believing in you. Do a great work in their hearts and lives right now. And for the women, it's the same thing. You, you may come a little different and with different thoughts, but it's the same thing. You've got to humble yourself before the great king. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Humble yourself before him and he will do exceedingly great and mighty things in and through your life. 
country. God bless you. And if you've prayed that prayer with us, you're in the kingdom now. Praise God. We Amen. love you all. And God bless you. And thank you, Ken. Thank yes. you.